We're going a long slope, it looks like. It's that 2,000 meter 8 to 12 party, y'all. Let's go. I'm going to need some love out there from the internet, from the control van. I'm pretty tired this morning, but we're going to make it happen. This looks like a beautiful place to be. Sure is. Welcome to the 8 to 12 watch. Where apparently we are looking at a steep ridge. Yeah. Coral covered. Long slope. Mm -hmm. Beautiful question coming in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wondering if seamounts are growing or shrinking. They're growing in our hearts, but they're shrinking in size. I don't know if that's even true, but we'll, we'll pass that over. We'll, we'll pass that over to Val. What's um, happening to these sea mounts? Yeah, well, these are all uh, extinct, which means they're no longer uh, able to erupt and haven't erupted in tens of millions of years, at least. Uh, so um, they're staying about the same size, but what they, what happens over time is, uh, especially once you have a, a newly more or less extinct uh, uh, volcano being generated from a hot spot. Um, that that, uh, that uh, hot spot or the mantle plume un underneath it uh, has a lot of uh, upward buoyancy sometimes, and uh, that will push up the uh, seafloor a little bit, so your crust gets uh, elevated, and then as that uh, seamount moves off of the hot spot, it eventually moves off of that flexed up area. So they don't shrink, but they do subside. Oh. So they end up a little deeper than when they started. I thought you were going to say they don't shrink, but they do sink. But no, they subside. We call it subside. <laughs> Either one subside. works. Oh, okay. I was so just excited. Gravity's still doing its thing, and the boulders roll downhill. Yeah, I guess it, I guess gravity's still helping these roll downhill, but yeah. super slowly. <laughs> oh, Daniel. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> My velvety voice. I love you guys. I love the internet. They're being extra kind. Sorry, Emma. They're being extra kind to me this morning. I love it. They want. Uh, they want Robert, you and I, to create a podcast together. You ready? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Dan and Aquaman coming yeah. at you. Oh, that's catchy. Let's go. Why am I? Yep, so I've been, I've been told that there are a ton of waypoints uh, for this dive, so She's we planned out. Still. Total of 11 waypoints, and we're really interested in reaching the end of this dive because, uh, uh, because we see a structure up at the summit of this volcano that looks suspiciously like a caldera. Ooh. And um, I am here for calderas. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the rest of you. What is a caldera? Oh, a caldera is a. Um, There's a fish. It's 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 related to a volcanic crater, but it's uh, uh, much wider than it is deep. So, um, if you think of like the, uh, like Kilauea, mm -hmm. up at the summit, it has that uh, circular kind of oval area that's uh, dropped down right at the summit. Oh. That's a caldera. Okay. Yeah. It's where we throw the people in when they're misbehaving, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> or when they don't like mayonnaise. That's right. Oh, whoops. Oh. I'm kidding, I'm oh, kidding. So Guilty as charged. Much love, much love. <laughs> One might say that a caldera is a unit of a crater. <laughs> <laughs> they can get quite large. I like that measurement. <laughs> Tabu is one measurement of a unit, well, throwing off the ROV. <laughs> so in other words, Dr. Val is telling you, telling Aquaman to speed it up. Get us to the cold there. Come on. <laughs> and we're all on excited the about, uh, about the end, end of this dive, so uh, why not? <laughs> I, mean, we don't, I mean, we're on waypoint three out of 11, so. Point three out of 11? Oh, uh, point wait, number wait point. three. Number, oh, yeah, waypoint point three. 
we can go that far. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't need to go blistering <laughs> point three knots. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. I did get in to change our bearing just to kind of head a little bit more okay. up, up to the ridge. All right. Everybody sounds much better in my ear now. So mm -hmm. whatever was up with the audio seems to be good. Good, good, good. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it is funny. I always have to come in and like turn the audio way down when I come in. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Must have had a hot mic somewhere. This is a nice stack of uh, pillow basalts. They're all kind of oh, deposited on top of each other, flowed atop each other. I think there's like a sponge, like a for all the bubble stalks. I think so. Hold fast. Something like almost every one of these. Used to be a forayed forest. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Parades <laughs> <laughs> in Walteria. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So from what I understand, we have we a rock, know. and none of the Niskins are behaving. No, they are not. Per apparently, Boo. whoever rigged them did not do it right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> who who was that? that? You? I don't know. Because <laughs> well, we got on deck, and we're, we just like, nah, just go to lunch. <laughs> what? Yeah, because we, uh, we didn't mess with the Niskin. All we did was uh, wash up. We were, we were post dive. Supposed to derig the Niskins on the post time, but rig the Niskins. <coughs> yeah, there's a brass hook on there that people tend to want to put right in the loop because it looks like oh, that's yeah, what you'd no. want to do, mm -hmm. but that's absolutely not what you want to do. It's it's. It's not uncommon to have a couple dives where the Niskins well, are. Yeah, and we then, had yeah. That one the other day. Same, same yeah. thing. Yep. Yeah. And even when you're doing just CTDs, um, like throwing throwing these Niskins off of the, um, <clears throat> like on a rosette off the side of the boat and doing a, a true CTD profile and with Niskins and water samples, um, it's pretty common for one, maybe two to be either improperly rigged or to not, um, just not, not fire. To fire properly. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I printed bigger uh, lotto balls here for the, well, at least for number one. We don't have enough filament and the printer just got stuck, but, mm. but it won't slip through the big fingers now. So nice. It should make it easier, I hope. Yeah, one of our scientists ashore has been uh, giving us a little bit of an update on the sponges. Uh, lots of dead in-place Walteria sponges. Mm -hmm. Lots of dead sponges overall. Um, uh, notes plenty of downed ET sponge stocks. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of a sponge dive today. And our Olelo Hawaii word for sponge is hu'akai. 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 It's a hu'akai heavy dive. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Zach, getting a shout out from your cousin. Uh, Philly, who says, I hope you're learning a lot and behaving well so you don't <laughs> get tossed into a caldera. Oh. <laughs> well, Good I hate out. to apologize, but if we if we do get up to waypoint 11, we'll be tossing ourselves into an old caldera. <laughs> <laughs> what we think is a caldera. <laughs> oh, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun making our way. This will just be our first watch of this dive. We'll uh, hopefully get to be in the caldera on our second one. So Dr. Val gets the, yeah, that would be good timing, wouldn't it? 
Shall I'll yeah, actually, actually on the end. That was, it's more of an end of dive thing. But yeah. I can, uh, if you want yeah, to pick it up. Yeah, sounds like Belle wants to see the Caldera. <laughs> We're going to do that. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Some of our viewers noticing the same thing you did, Virginia, is all these, uh, these little hold fast, these little sponge remains. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to see the, the, the locations that have held these sponges. Um, I heard earlier that there were a lot of dead sponges that they saw earlier, so, um, you know, this could be a pattern for this depth zone that maybe below they were able to see some of the dead sponges that have fallen off of these locations. Um, mm. <clears throat> one of our researchers on shore mentioned that, um, uh, Scott France mentioned that uh, it's actually pretty, there's, there are a few ways to like degrade these sponges. You know, there's not a lot of bacteria or like um, organism or, you know, megafauna that actually like eat or decompose the silica. And so some of these dead sponges, you know, with the little amount of sedimentation as well, some of these dead sponges could be here a very long time on the seafloor. Um, so these holdfasts similarly could be exceptionally old. So mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting to see the mix of the dead holdfast, the dead sponges, and the live well and the live sponges as well, um, with all of their associates. Yeah, can confirm. Uh, silica is very hard to break down. <laughs> <laughs> it either takes so a how ton long of is time that long? or uh, some really, really harsh reagents. Yeah. yeah. Like stuff you want to keep in a fume hood so you don't die. Mm -hmm. So, are we talking millions of years? Or I mean, it's glass. Of or what? Um, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe a couple million millions of years at the outset. Definitely thousands of years. It could be sticking around. Uh, silicon's pretty insoluble in water. Would it, would it get covered with the manganese? Uh, if it's around long enough, definitely it could. Yeah. I don't think we're seeing much of that on these. We're probably still looking at the thousands, maybe tens of thousands okay. kind of time yeah. frame. But those whale bones that we've been seeing occasionally, those are coated in manganese. So, you know, they've been sitting there for uh, That's pretty yeah. cool. uh, millions of years. It's actually kind of interesting. Actually, now, so um, two things. One, Scott Scott France from uh, Ashore agrees with you, thinking uh, thousands of years. <laughs> um, but two, actually, just realized that um, whale bones. There are mechanisms for those to be degraded in the deep sea. Right. Yeah. So they're carbonate. So how? So it's so interesting to me that then we're seeing whale bones from millions of years ago that actually were not degraded by the mechanisms that were around when in a time when there I mean were there more whales yeah I mean I know that there <laughs> have there have like I mean there I think there have been few instances when there have been fewer whales than there are right now except when like pre whale right so like um so if uh so like so basically i'm like did are they are these from pre-bone eating worms well i don't know you do know you even get bone eating worms down at this depth oh I'm absolutely okay. the, the jaw bone so there's maybe something about the jaw bone that the yeah like the bone eating worms don't like that or something yeah because hmm. we're not finding the rest of the skeleton yeah off to google yeah I mean, what would make the beaked whale bone different um, so what part of that bone, like what part of the, the anatomy it's are we seeing I with those bones? I think it's the, like one of the, like the, the lower nose. jaw. Yeah, the lower, lower jaw, jaw nose. Okay, type. so it's not all, it's it's not entirely teeth, so I can't explain it away by, uh, uh, like the appetite enamel on her, in her teeth. Yeah. Because that could potentially stick around, but, um, that's not going to explain the jaw bone because normally jaw bones don't have, uh, that enamel, uh, that our teeth do. Well, jawbone. Google to the rescue. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, I've been looking at these bones for ages, and now I'm like, wait. Why?
So many mysteries. Yeah. So many mysteries in the so deep sea. So much Google Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> well, 8 to 12 watch. The world already knows you so well, but I'm sure they'd love another round of introductions. Possible for us to mix it up, go front row first? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Catalina, and I am a navigator here, uh, helping out the ROV pilots find their way around. Um, and I'm a master's student at USF's College of Marine Science in St. Pete, Florida. Oh, okay. hey, I'm Robert Waters. I'm a HERT pilot and OET's facilities manager and ROV engineer. And I live in L.A. I'm Zach Gonzalez, uh, Atlanta pilot, uh, Robert's uh, helper, minion, whatever you want to call him. Padawan. <laughs> <laughs> Padawan. There we go, Padawan. <laughs> uh, from Houston, Texas. Uh, been doing ROV for a few years. Enjoying my time out here. And I'm Amber Flynn, a uh, video engineer, and also from LA. Lobster, yeah. Oh, and so just amazing. Up, oh, zooming in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it's another one of those uh, lobsters. Lobster. Yeah, they're um, slipper. Um, slipper lobster, blind lobster, or uh, poly Kelly. Wow. They're so cool. Oh, well, here's part of your answer about the whale bones. Um, I just looked up the carbon comp uh, carbon compensation depth because I can never remember where that is. It's about a. Uh, 4,500 meters, so we're well above that, and it if makes it a little Atlantic. Uh, um, <coughs> we'll but find one yeah, for the but I mean, um, there are organisms that eat bone um, in the deep sea. I saw one of these in my room this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Atlantic With Basin <laughs> CCD is only about 500 uh, 500 meters deeper than the Pacific, so we're we're still going to be well above that. So. They're, they're not just going to, like, dissolve away. That's why we still see, like, crabs and stuff, too. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm so. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that the bones would dissolve. I'm saying that there are organisms that eat bone in the right. deep sea. And I'm wondering why we don't see them eating this. Yeah. Uh, maybe. <coughs> I'm maybe wondering if there's a different amount of, like, lipid oh, content. Okay. Maybe. It could also be that... You know, Maybe uh, where we're seeing some of these falls wasn't so hospitable to the kind of life that would colonize and eat that. But there's only so much I can infer from current conditions that we're looking at right now, because uh, obviously, given where we've seen these uh, fields of uh, sponge hold fast already on watch, um, that, that tells you that things have changed a little bit here and there over time. Well, but we're still seeing these sponges. Yeah, just fewer that are alive. Over thousands of years, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a similar there's density there's over over years. It's just the number of holdfasts you're seeing I mean, like, have stayed the same. You know, climate, tec uh, tectonics can all change this kind of stuff oh, too. Oh yeah. So there, I mean, there have been changes, but yeah, yeah. Uh, on the thousands of years time scale, that's probably a much slower rate of change. But I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the geologist thing, and I'm thinking about big time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> deep time. Yeah. Some, actually, these days I'm better at deep time than I am at, like, more reasonable time scales for humans. Oh. Yeah. I'm actually reading a paper right now about um, whale bones and lipid content. So okay. Interesting. Apparently, it does change throughout the body, which is kind of interesting. Um, Our good friend Jason uh, tuning in online says he recalls hearing it's the density, has something to do with the density of the whale bone. 
makes it huh. more difficult okay. more difficult for worms. Thanks for that hint, for that little clue, Jason. We appreciate you. I can imagine the jawbone would be pretty sturdy. Right? Yeah. yeah. It would have to be, yeah. You know, and one thing that this paper is saying is, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the the organisms that actually eat through the bone and, um, and, and such, they... Um, it's to get to the, the lipid content too. There's a lot of fat within some of these these bones, um, the marrow, um, but there's less um, oil in um, in red marrow than there is in like you know the the oily marrow too. So it could be. Are we looking at a starfish. Yeah, it looks like it's right. eating something. Or is it just sitting? Or there? is it just hanging out? That's oh, fun. Mm -hmm. Hi, Patrick. Another crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> Just me, just me, SpongeBob. <laughs> Zoom in. Maybe that is SpongeBob. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. SpongeBob's looking a little worse Looks for like the wear there. Oh, that's another yeah. one of those. <laughs> Eaten. It, it is Do you need a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, definitely. We all need hugs. Mm -hmm. Front row, we're giving you our virtual hugs from the back row. We, we love you guys. Thanks for your introductions. Back row. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, pilots. <laughs> Want to let them have it? Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> Kukui, you want to kick us off? How's it, everybody? My name is Kukui. Um, I come from the island of Maui, and I am one of the data loggers on board. And I'm so stoked and blessed to be here with you all, uh, both on board and um, ashore as well. Um, and getting to be able to dive again in Papahana Mukuakea. So, mahalo. Mahalo, Kukui. Um, hi all, I'm Virginia. I'm a PhD student at Florida State University. I have the privilege of studying some of the seamounts within this, within this, in the, within this area, although not particularly this seamount. It is very exciting to see this one. And actually, can we get a zoom on this? <laughs> um, <laughs> zoom in. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's so great to be here with these folks and to work on this. Um, I uh, have a focus on anthropogenic impacts on some of these seamounts, um, and it's really great to to be here um, Hello? looking at these corals now. And actually, this is pretty cool. This is coral? looking like a black coral with some um, somewhat interesting that is uh, branching different. pattern. Um, there are some there are some black corals that have this almost less it's very symmetrical but also less symmetrical if that makes any sense um branching um but that's pretty interesting and we've got a we've got a squat in it as well mm -hmm. that's pretty cool yeah i'm wondering if it's a uh, scott suggested chiselpathies i was wondering awesome yeah thanks scott um, he's suggesting uh, trisopathies, which makes sense. That's awesome. Yeah. Boop. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Looks like there's a cup coral. So we're seeing oh, a few yeah. different things here and there. That's wonderful. Um, oh, right, we were doing introductions. Yeah, go for it. I think I, <laughs> I, think I said my Caffeine bit. hasn't quite kicked in yet. Uh, yeah, I'm Val Finlayson, um, watch lead and one of the co-lead scientists on this expedition. Um, I'm a postdoc at University of Maryland, and uh, I uh, study the geochemistry, uh, uh, mostly isotope geochemistry, but a few other things too, um, of seamounts uh, like this one that we're uh, surveying right now. So I kind of work all over the Pacific on a number of different hot spots, but uh, right now one of the uh, uh, big focal areas is pretty close to where we are right now within uh, Papahanaumokuakea, mm. uh, uh, trying to identify the uh, origins of uh, the Luliokalani Lulio Seamounts to our north. So it's pretty cool work. It's fun. 
I'm doing Dissolving it. silica is hard. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. But uh, exploring these seamounts is also hard, but a lot of fun. And um, you've been a great watch lead, Dr. Thank Val. You. Thank you for thank you for guiding us on this journey and uh, and for the amazing science you're you're doing. We got some good rock samples, I think, from this expedition. I think so. Yeah, it's been been a success. Uh, and we still got this dive and one more. It ain't over yet. This is Daniel Kinzer. I uh, live in Honolulu, on the island of Oahu, in the Hawaiian Islands, and. Um, do a lot of work across education, conservation, technology, and culture, and um, mostly just trying to find the party, having the best time I can, um, and uh, found it, 8 to 12 watch on the board Indeed. the Nautilus. I'm glad yes, to be here. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha kakahiaka, hauoli la, or hauoli po alima. Happy Friday, everyone. Good morning. Jeez. Oh, it's Friday. Friday. Yeah. Um, oh, Mahina Lenny Cavallari, Poinoa, no Oahu. My name is Mahina Lenny Cavallari, and I'm from the island of Oahu. A big weekend plan. And it oh, yeah. is Friday. <laughs> uh, we lose track of time out here, but we're so grateful to be out in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, second to last dive, a lot of mixed emotions. It's so bittersweet, but been really enjoying all the time out here and learning from our people on board. Amazing crew, amazing pilots, video engineers, educators, scientists, and board. And just excited to see what we have left for the rest of this time out here. Thank you. Mahalo nui. Mahalo mihina. Thanks, mihina. I was thinking at some point, I think we need to get an 8 to 12 picture all together. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yes, definitely. absolutely. For our 8 to 12 t-shirts? Yeah, yes. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> With our faces on them or out? Oh, no. <laughs> Stay tuned for the 8 to 12 merch. Yeah. <laughs> Order yours online. Yeah. Always hustling. <laughs> okay, so because I'm still on this whalebone situation. Cause yeah, I'm speak of the devil. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no. Can we get a zoom on that, please? <laughs> that just set itself unreal. up. Unreal. <laughs> Which is so exciting, though, because there's a paper that actually looked at um, information from whaling. Can we zoom as in? well as, like, all sorts of different... I think it's so interesting. It's like a review paper, basically, looking at whaling and other organisms and such. Mm. That oh, that's is a teeny bit colonized. Oh. Yeah, so one thing that they were saying... There's two things that they were saying is... Um, that the lipid component, that's where um, you get the high sulfur producing organisms. Um, and so that's different in different portions of bones. And then afterwards, the bioerosion that happens is minimal and it's on the outside. Mm. Um, and that takes a really long time. So they have this nice little graphic on uh, different types of organisms that they've got some of this data on. And the lower jaw on some of these organisms has some of the lowest amount of lipids. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so you can kind of see that in these different areas, um, besides CA, which m might be some of their part of their upper jaw, but, um, and it does change, right? So like um, A in this is a fin whale and that's got more than some of their thro thoracic bones, but E is a sperm whale, and that actually has the least amount of, wait, am I seeing this? All right, thanks for the zoom. Oh no, it's a gray whale, and that has, yeah, so it's really interesting. So the lipid content changes by species and um, per bone, and the lipid content is what is driving the sulfur, um, the like the bone eating and sulfur producing um, mats and such wow. that degrade these bones. So that is potentially why we are seeing jaw bones. Cool. I it's so cool. Yeah, they just like that, that one we yeah. happened across. <laughs> just like the one we just saw. Amazing. Is there a lead author on that you can share with us? Yeah, so this it's was a by call. a Nicholas D. Higgs. All right. Um, oh, and actually, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's uh, Nicholas D. Higgs, Crispin T.S. Little, and Adrian G. Glover. Mahalo. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, no, that was really cool. Oh, that's beautiful. It is. You got a beautiful Aritagorgia fire firework display in, in front of fave. us. It's a tall one. Yeah. yeah. I've seen them three times that. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they can get pretty large. Where did you see that one, Robert? Where we were earlier this year. <laughs> um. <laughs> it all blends in. Forgets. Can we zoom in? is a stunning, stunning view. Yeah, and actually, um, these, <clears throat> it's uh, the whirling pattern that we can see is really important um, on these corals. They don't have that big of a hold faster how big the coral is, you know? I wonder if that, um, I wonder if that swirling design, like what, uh, what function that serves, like if it's more hydrodynamic, if it allows them to support. Yeah, I can hear that too. What's happening with the audio? Why are we getting, oh, okay, that's better. And what's really cool with these? Um, I think it's I think it's me. Oh, there. Oh, I don't hear it quite as much anymore. Um, I think she fixed it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there I was touched nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I, everybody just make sure that they're like firmly plugged into their headset because if it's not, it will do the front speaker. Oh. Um, okay. How's that? I think it was my mic earlier, but it seems like feedback's gone. Okay. You guys still hear me okay? Uh, sounds yeah. much better yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. Well, maybe you had the, the, the boom mic on or something. All right. Hmm. Maybe. Well, let's see, where are we right now for depth? Uh, about 2,030 meters. Okay. Yeah. Someone's got their eyes on the rocks. Always. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if many of these are going to be anything we can get off the seafloor right now. So. Mm -hmm. Are you looking to collect a rock? Because we um, sped up, so we need to think about it ahead of time. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about it, but not right here. Because right. I, I think everything's stuck to everything. Yeah. Oh, there's some beautiful Chrysoporgia there. In the yeah, we're there's seeing a small little pseudoanthomastis, I think, here and there. Oh, I must have missed them. Yeah. To be yeah, fair, I have right there now. Pretty, yeah. Pretty yeah. much scrolling through a couple papers looking for that information. Hey, so nothing wrong with the uh, chasing whales. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting. You can see a lot of the the sponge, the dead sponges. Um, uh, there's an old crevices and around old sponge. Yeah, and that dead sponge there on the left as well. There's several of these. Um, there's actually a lot of these dead sponges. Wow. Oh, uh, morning, Asako. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a researcher ashore was reminding us that these 
these sponges um, are probably, the dead sponges have probably been on the sea floor for a very long time because mm -hmm. it takes a while for silica to degrade. Oh, you're right. There's another pseudoanthomasis there, the red yeah. blob. They're not, they're not terribly common, but they're, they're hanging out. Yeah. So you can see this is already uh, uh, kind of a steep topographic feature, bathymetric feature. I keep mm -hmm. getting those, I keep using those wrong. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. Um, yeah, this was already pretty steep when the volcano was still active because some of these pillow basalts are going like straight down. So they just spilled down this, this little miniature cliff here. Okay. So it looks like it's getting oh, steeper. Thanks. So I need yeah. to stay, Ooh, stay yeah. on the ball here. It is. I was looking at my radar. Oh, apparently we are dealing with potential overhangs. Oh, yikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yikes, indeed. <laughs> oh, this is why Herc has bumpers, just in case. <laughs> Coming up. Not just for bowling. Bumpers are uh, <laughs> bumpers are important. <laughs> <Deep sea for, laughs> okay, that was good. That was good. I, I try. I try. <laughs> <laughs> it is the only way I bowl. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. There's come nothing on. wrong with bumpers. Oh, there is nothing on. wrong with bumpers. Yeah, for the for the four year olds. What's <laughs> going on? Well, come on. In my mind. Feeding our cats French <laughs> toes. <laughs> We're using bumpers <laughs> at the bowling alley. Lavender <laughs> gelato. Come on. Yeah, you can yeah, put the bumper so rails and come up, and then you can't go into the gutter. <laughs> what? Yeah, Kukui, you don't, try it. It's don't do it, Kukui. <laughs> Why not? Because you have amazing power. Wait, no bumper bowling for Kukui? Yeah. No. <laughs> Anyone who's doing actual bowling. Yeah. Come on. Well, <laughs> as long as you don't use the, the elephant slide. Have you all seen this? <laughs> the oh, elephant yeah. slide. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have small children. Oh. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, could we get some pass? She cut a rock last night. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you awesome. for letting me, Dr. Rao. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Couldn't quite wonderful. reach the, the end of it. <laughs> yeah, um. it's not it's not a perfectly ergonomic setup. The table that it's on is a little is like a couple inches too high and we don't have we don't have a better option, so sometimes it's a little bit of a reach. Maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll get a stool. But that was fun. <laughs> Is that the rock side you're saying? Yeah. Oh. Robert, when it's you one of my favorite tools on the ship. Mm -hmm. When you avoided uh, diving into that cliff face um, in front of you, what were you looking at to intuition? To intuition. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's what that was. What I was suspecting, honestly. Um. You're so funny. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah, That's you get good enough at what you do, and you. you you can kind of you can kind of get this gut feeling about certain things. Yep. I mean, yeah, we, ha we have a lot like of. I've seen a few cliff bases. So. Seen a few, <laughs> yeah. Have. Seen a few. That was very, that was great great job piloting. That was impressive. Oh, it looks like we've got another uh, what? Ghani asteroids few star there. Some a few of them. Wow. Beautiful. Oh, this is a beautiful coral in front of us. Yeah. Just oh. so dense, too. Mm hmm. Does that have paragorgia below it? Mm. Ooh. The pink, probably. Yeah. 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 The white is. Um, it's a Kali Pachafra. I've seen a couple names thrown around. Right. The, so it looks like tons of names. corals right here. Yeah. yeah. Where it must be near the top. We're sort of seeing over the top with the sonar. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I love that minimum zoom view. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. Go right up to the top there. Oh, that is a big fan. Yeah. You got any big fans of fans out there? <laughs> 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 you zoom in? Uh, we're 
Jimmy's giving me that look again. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful pernoid in front of us. It's got, um, um, looks like two two polyps of either side of its branch. Mm. Sako and Scott are suggesting yeah, a or Paliptrophora. Possibly Calyptrophora uh, or Paracalyptrophora. Yeah. Um, well, interesting. So it looks like there's some... Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and it's it's not on the base there either, which is pretty interesting too. Are those failed branches we're seeing on the left? Could be just some that broke. Okay. Yeah. So they're pretty rounded over on the ends. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I think they've they might have done something with them. Okay. Yeah. And this one looks to be about the same. Barnacle. Very similar. Yeah. yeah. And it's even got some of the same sort of looking, same types of associates as well, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you. Mm, excellent. And, and uh, Scott, um, Scott uh, France from uh, Scientists Ashore mentions that we have seen a lot of them today, which is a really nice. important thing for us to know because we don't always I get know. the chance to. Um, uh, watch between our between our watches outside of the van. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we do have to sleep at some point. I know, it's very <laughs> important. Oh, a nice brisingit on the left. And um, it is, I mean, sleep is so, so important. And it's something that, you know. Um, uh, Catalina, what's the ship's move looking like? Sorry for interrupting. No, no you're good. So we have been tracking a line towards waypoint, like right between waypoint 4, 4 and 4.5. Okay. Are you interested in sampling or? Um, yeah, this might be a good place to grab a rock. Okay. I don't. I didn't know if it was can, a good time or not. I can get him to get us to hold position. Okay, thank you. Yeah, some of these look loose. We okay. zoom in. It's been a couple hundred meters since our last collection, so <laughs> might as well. Might as well. Beautiful Chrysoborgia and Paragorgia out there. Yeah, too. I love the colors that the bubblegum corals mm -hmm. can t uh, take on. It's really bold reds like this one. Yeah, it's like a like classic coral color. And then you get those bright yellow ones that it's are pretty so awesome stunning. too. It's so stunning. Now it looks like that's a uh, one entire associate on it too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've been noticing that some of these paragorgias have very large um, ophiuroids. They do, yeah. On them. Scott, they're also called snake stars. Oh. What are they called? Sorry. Snake stars? I gotta get back to the <laughs> other thing. Oh, I've heard them called serpent stars, but yeah. I haven't heard snake stars. <laughs> That's cool. The winding arms. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Scott. Did you want to look at um, the rocks, Val? Um, I can see some pretty good rubble in this area okay. so I mean, we're yeah. still moving a bit I yeah yeah you know what? once i so said that i realized uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right in this exact spot yeah because then if if we just called in a pause to the ship we're still catching up a bit yeah so everything's still moving um, moved into uh definitely up top, on the top of lava flow to uh bathymetry mm -hmm. so yeah we'll, we'll look for a spot to sit down Probably off to one of the sides, we'll have a little better luck picking up some rubble again. But if we don't see anything here, we can keep moving. <coughs> Got uh, two. Do you want to get off of the top? Or? Um, yeah, could we move maybe a little bit to the right and see if uh, uh, this lava flow truncates somewhere? Mm-hmm. 
Perhaps not. That's a large bunch in the back. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of sponges. Wow. It's a beautiful lava field. Mm -hmm. Very glued down, though. It's just, <laughs> it's all stuck to itself. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> is, yeah. Definitely is. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything here. Uh, you want to look at a sponge while we're here? Yeah, yeah we could do that. And then, a nice anemone. Anemone and okay. Uh Let's see where we are here. Is there a hualalo for anemone? Okala. Okala. Nice. Malo maina. Yeah. Oh, this is gorgeous. Wow. Mm hmm. Wow. Beautiful. Get some opai on that too. Yeah. This is the kind of uh, huokai sponge that Amber and Catalina would, you would like to live in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beautiful home. A beautiful it is. glass beautiful. sponge home. Speaking of Catalina's home, uh, hello and sending love to Catalina from St. Petersburg. We're oh, all so hey. proud of you and oh. can't wait to have you back home. Oh, wonderful. So sweet. Aloha. Thank you. <laughs> That's sweet. It looks like there's some pink polyp, like Are these little tiny anemones in here, too. Yeah. Oh, I see. What oh, you mean. yeah, sure enough. There's several associates in there. Yeah, I think one right there too. Yeah. Oh, what is that? A whole slew of them over here. It is a what whole zoo. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's one of these uh, things of animals building on animals. We oh, saw it last time. Absolutely. Dive. Well, and sponges create their own currents, so they I do. Mean, yeah. Kind so. of. Makes sense. I still sense. find it amazing. Yeah. Take advantage of that. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is uh, another euplectelid sponge. Uh, Catalina, for uh, navigational purposes, once we move on, do we want to try a couple of maybe 25 meter hops sure. to look for a rock? And yeah, then we after can that, that, we can. Thank you. For sure. And then after that, so we can maybe go track off of a bit more. Top here? Off the top? So probably over. Yeah, over I think here. so. Yeah. Because it looks. Well, I guess I can go. No, you yeah. can go over there. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> if if uh, the map we're looking at is pretty close to reality, it should we should hit a slightly right, flatter zero. spot. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Look at those pillow basalts. So we were right on the edge anyway. Yeah. yeah, still not seeing a whole lot on the edge here. That so. is the end of your leash. Yeah, we gotta wait. Gotta wait around. No worries. I have a random question about those sponges. Well, sponges in general. I could be making this up, so I apologize if this sounds weird. But it, I thought I remember hearing something about a certain kind of sponge, like really pretty sponge like that being like given as like a wedding gift? Do you guys, do you recall that at all? Yeah, I've heard of wedding sponges yeah. as a gift. Um, um, it's, <laughs> you can hear us all typing now. <laughs> yeah, because uh, we all want to know what this is. Uh, I'm yeah, glad you because remember. Because there there like there's often two shrimps that that's are within oh, these small that's white it. sponges. Yeah. I don't think there's specifically those sponges that we see here, but I do believe that there it is a, a, it is a gift in different cultures, I think. That's um, it. And it's like those, you know, these two shrimps live their entire lives like that because they get in 
Um, I don't think they're larvae, but they're probably juvenile. They're very small. Mm -hmm. And then they actually grow to the size they're too large to actually leave the sponge. Yeah, and so that, there's yeah. two shrimp um, that live in there their entire lives, pretty much their entire adult lives together. Okay. Thank you for remembering that. It was like on the back of my mind, I was like, am I making this up? No, you're not making this up. Um, yeah, just like what Virginia said about the shrimp eventually getting trapped in the coral. Apparently this is a uh, Japanese uh, custom mm -hmm. to give um, the sponge away as a wedding gift, symbolizing the wedding vow till death do us part. And uh, oh. it seems like uh, it's the uh, Euplectella aspergillum that's commonly given. Cool. Yeah. It's a very beautiful. So one of those uh, sort of vase-like yeah. looking sponges. Cool. Pretty That's really interesting. Yeah. That, thanks for sharing that. No, thanks yeah, for looking it up and confirming that. Ah, yes, Asako confirms. <laughs> awesome. It's a lovely symbolism in that. Mm -hmm. Something really big on that sponge. Yeah. Oh, is it a sea spider? Oh, yeah. I think so, yeah, yeah oh. right there. Virginia, <laughs> avert your eyes. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we were exactly. having, a, having a great conversation about sea I'll spiders yesterday. Let that one go. <laughs> interesting little long-legged critters. It's something about the legs. I'm just, yeah. just too many legs, yeah. yeah. And the way they bend, I they're perfect. So <laughs> you, can, you can tell what's the male and the female by the, like the graspers on the. I believe you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the uh, distinction. Some yep. extra leg things going on in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good morning for everybody hanging out in the lounge. We are featuring a sea spider. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Make a good wedding gift. <laughs> what, a sea spider? <laughs> Maybe a birthday present for an eight year old. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't say love to you? Uh, <laughs> not quite the same symbolism as the sponge. <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> could, could I explain the thought. <laughs> could explain a lot of challenges in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are those like grippers or vestigial legs or something on its yeah, underside? Yeah, Interesting. I, I think that has something to do with telling whether they're male or female by the, okay. the shape of those things. I guess they're kind of graceful uh, in the water. They are. Are you wanting to look at the kind of the, their near the little mandibles by their mouth? Um. Oh, oops. Sorry. You want to get closer? We're looking at those. You see, you I think we got a pretty good zoom it? on this. Um. I think this is a pretty good zoom. Just kind of curious about can get closer. what those can are. Zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's because mm -hmm. you're right there. Mm -hmm. Sea spiders like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Zoom in. I think I just saw the word ovigers. I'm waiting for. Let's see, come on, you can load up web page. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's so cool. Okay, three to four sets of a appendages, including a pair of claws and a pair of ovigers, or ovigers, not sure, which are used for grooming and egg carrying. So yeah. yeah. 
females are also generally larger than males. It's pretty common with insects, but um, mm -hmm. it's it's actually it's okay. Not an uncommon. All right. Um, yeah. We gotta bail. Okay. Yeah. Let's bail. Beautiful, Sam. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, some fish are like that too, where um, uh, the sexual dimorphism is pretty extreme. Like uh, angler fish have really uh, tiny well, males, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That I mean, I I don't think I was I I think it's like you know, a, a varied size. Um, yeah, uh, but I mean, it's it's not uncommon for there to be a little bit larger females because. Um, you know, if uh, and what's mentioned here is uniparental care. So if only one parent is taking care of the offspring, mm -hmm. then usually it makes sense for that um, parent to be larger because they probably need larger food stores and you know, um, etc., 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 etc. For yeah um, reasons why being large can be important for these organisms. So uh, yeah, it's pretty. In it's uh, it's pretty cool. Are we yeah. are we settled in? Yes. Okay, so we gotta find a rock now. <laughs> yeah. Um, no dice so far, but we'll find something. There's some right here underneath Atlanta, maybe? Oh, coming up top? Yeah. yeah that nice spot, Zach. That might be a good place to search. It is looking a little rubbly up there, isn't it? <clears throat> well, there's slipper lobster, it looks like. Uh, yeah, if they're able to hit the caldera after midnight, I may have to stay up and uh, <laughs> and, and watch. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd stay up and watch. Yeah, I might. Absolutely. I got a few things I got to do today after watch anyway, so I'll probably be up up and about all day. Some rocks in here. Because, uh, yeah, we, uh, for sunset, Hannah and I, uh, and uh, Kukui and Tori um, all did a little bit of rock cutting. And uh, that means that there's plenty more to describe now in the lab. So Yay. get those uh, all squared away for uh, the repositories and everybody who's uh, been asking for samples. So, woohoo! Great, great, great. Um, and then we'll finally have a few rocks left in the lab for everybody to trip over. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely almost tripped over one yesterday. Oh no, like, uh, I'm sorry. It was No, it was just in front of the door. Um, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, I don't yeah. know why. It, yeah, well, they're kind things, of encroaching at the moment. Things get moved around, you know? Yeah. Things get moved around. Sometimes nope. and they don't get put back. It's not, it, I was not like, blaming you or anything but i was like ah yes rocks <laughs> <laughs> they, they are encroaching a little bit and that's one of the things i need to do today is uh go box up a few of them so just didn't quite have the chance to do it yesterday mm -hmm. and then i got stuck on the puzzle again yes yeah oh the puzzle i saw the puzzle got finished we finished it Number i'm so eight. impressed a little before 11 30 last night and then as soon as it was done the three of us just like like scattered to the winds to go to bed yeah <laughs> okay see i'm glad i left at 10 10 15 because i was like yeah i will just continue to do this until actually it was four of us by then because uh kukui came and helped oh nice i got one piece you are amazing <laughs> <laughs> where would they have been without that one piece totally lost oh thanks guys a nice little uh, oh, wow. cliff face here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting looking sponge. They are juxtaposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sponge <laughs> and that coral right there on top of each other. That's what I'm saying mean, about are mutualism. Yeah, mm -hmm. are they on the same hold fast? I think they're on the same <laughs> hold fast. Same hold fast. <laughs> the squat I call that splitting run. And yeah. there's a, a squat mm -hmm. lobster. Oh, oh, and a oh, a fish. Awesome. Oh, it's got downward facing polyps. Oh, yeah. Ooh, what is this I telling us? I think it's us? a Norella. Norella, okay. It's like the only, that's like the only thing that I know of that can potentially differentiate some of these um, just by looking. Because most of the time when you're looking at primnoids, you have to differentiate with um, use of a microscope. Uh, which you don't have on an ROV, so um, you know a lot. Of, a lot of the times, it's pretty difficult to differentiate these organisms. But I, that's my that's my guess. So 
because um, they are all facing downwards. But that's pretty cool. And we've got some uh, ophiroids, and we had that squat lobster. And you've, you're right. We've got this sponge here on the right with a lot more of those little. Oh pink, yeah. Um, those polyps. Yeah. Oh, and snails. Oh. Oh, <laughs> <I wonder. laughs> Snails. oh, we are funny. We are simple people. <laughs> Snails are cool. Snails very are cool. cool. Snails cool. are cool. This is what we're, I mean, yeah. So these polyps that are growing in the sponge, are they uh, like individual or is this a colonization that's happening? You know, it looks, I mean, it, it looks Crap. like individuals. There's a lot of them. I it kind of does, doesn't sure. it? Sure. I mean, it could here? be that they're like that they're. I mean, it could be that they're a colony of the growing on the inside with like you know like the stolons that we were seeing that have, you know, that yeah. go up. They have. Hmm. Yeah, because the whole surface looks to be covered pretty much. Yeah. Anyone able to see how many polyps there are, <laughs> or um, tentacle arms on one of these tentacle on, on one of these polyps? I tried to count the oh, previous oh. one we saw, no, and no, I don't yeah. think there was, was eight. No. Yeah, I think it's yeah. pretty, th they're too clear, so. Yeah. Um, Those that hair, see them? Hmm? Yeah. There's some. Okay, All right. maybe this is cool down there. Yeah, it is, but if you stay still, I can pretty close. Hold on. It's like one, two, one, two, I counted five, seven on that one. Yeah, I'm seven. counting seven on that one. Yeah. I counted six. Okay. Oh, yeah, so seven. that means they're not octocorals. So we got that going for us. We know more. Oh, that's interesting, nice. yeah. Okay, so usually we see a lot of octocorals. Mm -hmm. So there could be anemones. Do you want to get closer? Um, we are stopped, so we have the ability. Um, do you want to get a closer look? Um, we could. For Oh, and there's a cup coral on the boulder, too. Oh, nice. Zoom in. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. Thank you. Um, triangular looking thing. Oh, sorry. sorry. Let's Is try counting again. Mm -hmm. There so might be I'm a eight. smaller eight. Yeah. Yeah. Because they kind of look like the... Yeah, I'm just counting eight now. I think I am too, yeah. Let me go back to... Four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Well, they do kind of resemble what we were collecting as the stolen inference previously, and we know that they can um, overgrow all sorts of different organisms. Yeah. So would this have that kind of like five, six, film? Seven, definitely eight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm seeing, I'm counting that now, That's too. <laughs> Hey, counting is hard when it blends in. Counting <laughs> is difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's so clear. Yeah. And color. Yeah. So you awesome. think this might be some species of stolonifera? It could be. It could be any mm. number of other things. I am no expert, but, um, you know, it could be that. That'd be interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's a nice spot. That's, uh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thank you for that, y'all. Yeah, mahalo. Back to the rocks. Oh, Sako says that she believes this is an enemy association on Spench. Oh, Great. that would explain why we were seeing like seven polyps here and there. Mm -hmm. 
or seven tentacles on the polyps. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I get the terminology wrong. Like, I mix it up all the time. And it's easy to do in jargon heavy uh, <laughs> situations. Yes. Yeah, we've got a lot more of these bamboos here as well, it looks like. And, um, and several um, primnoids. I don't want a pair of gorsia. This one looks different, though. I think I it might have zoanthids on it. I think that I've, from what oh, wait, we no. have seen previously, I'm wondering if it has um, parasoanthids on it. Might just be a white coral. Could be. They do. They do come in white. They do come in white. Oh, it's a beautiful crinoid on that pair of gorgias. Yeah. Well. yeah, they're kind of glorious. They're, there's another one uh, just off screen, too, that's all curled up like that. Another crinoid. Oh. Can you zoom in? Uh, yeah, that looks like zoanthids. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice call on that. It's like completely, <laughs> completely colonized. Yeah. Holy it's cow. It's interesting because I was like, oh, that the branching, kind of, like, you know, the structure of it is similar in size to the Paragorgia and the Serpent Star reminds me of the Paragorgias, but the color and the bubbliness, I was like, that's wrong. So, zoanthids. That's beautiful. Okay, back to the rock. Yeah, thank you. for some rocks. Ooh, those up there are a little bit round. Yeah. So, let's see. Are these two round? I'm looking. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, maybe we could try this one that the lasers are sitting, uh, we're just sitting on. It might be attached. Be stick, though. Yeah, it might be attached. We can poke at it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If we're if we're uh, if everything's stuck on. here, we'll just keep Craft moving on. forward. Oh, um, uh, hydraulics. Uh, that is a big one. saying the freeze button was acting up. So. I'm ready. Well, it's not going to come up for a while because it's got to establish comms. Yeah, it's, it's not going to go anywhere until that blue light comes on. There's no, that's for the valve, the main valve. This rock? Yeah, that's the one. Yep, it's looking pretty stuck. Which probably means all of the others are in this area. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we try another spot. I, I don't think we're going to have a lot of luck here. All glued down. Yeah. And roundy. <laughs> you don't like nothing about these, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knows you, Val. Um, so, Val, the reason that these are stuck is uh, due to manganese crusting over time? Yep, very much yeah. so. Uh, they've been sitting around for 
It, it, this is this has probably been how they've been sitting for tens of millions of years, and uh, this manganese crust can act like glue on the seafloor. Wow. And that's something that just precipitates out of the water? Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Very, very slowly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we think those growth rates average somewhere along the lines of a few millimeters per million years. Wow. Wow, that is amazing. What? What are we seeing? What? <laughs> oh, it's two crinoids. It's crinoids. crinoids. <laughs> I see it now. Yeah, excellent. Crinoids gonna crinoid. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start sure giving us that another is. jump forward. Yeah, let's jump forward a little bit. Maybe okay. another 25 meters? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tricky, tricky rocks again today. Now the work that you do with rocks, Val, is um, can we zoom in? is not something that you can uh, use the mango manganese crusted rocks for. Um, not the not the work I'm doing right now, but um, there there are a couple of ferromanganese related projects I've been uh, yeah. toying with. Oh wow! Look at the zoanthids on this one. Oh, wow. or, wait, oh, no, oh, those are anemones. Those are anemones. Um, yeah, metrodio. I just saw them uh, retract. retract um, yeah. Anemones, yeah. Are those Probably young ones? From the, the wash and thrust. Sorry, are they what? Are those young or are they just tiny? I, I believe they're actually just small. There, okay. are, there are several. Um, <laughs> um, there are many different types of um, anemones. Metri what is this anemone called? Uh, uh, I think it's at? in the larger group of Metridiodia. Yeah. It looks like a lilikoi. <gasps> yeah. Oh. Oh. If you've ever eaten like a lily koi and you you scoop out like the sweet seed. <gasps> oh I'm my gosh. Another word for lily koi, common name? Uh, passion fruit? Passion fruit. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Almost looks like strawberry guava too, a little bit. Yeah. In the fruit. Oh yeah. You cut it open, yeah. Uh, are those hydroid branches on the, in the background? skeleton? Yeah. It kind of looks like, like it, maybe, doesn't it? Yeah. It does Ooh, look like that. It's yeah, so, so beautiful. Oh, look, tiny shrimp. Ah. A couple of them. No. Oh, some, yeah, some uh, amphipods. Uh, yeah. Amphipods. What's the distinguishing features of amphipods? I think it's. I think it's the the um, when you're comparing the shrimp, right? The sh it's Ooh. the comparison between like um, um, body body parts, oh, okay, okay. basically. And that is some slightly yeah. funky branching there. there Do they get bigger? Yeah, you're thinking fish tank though. <laughs> hey Zach, I think you may be off SPL. Yep, I am off SPL. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here talking to myself. No, I mean you're talking loud enough that we can hear you, but yeah. not very well. Yeah, but uh, anyways, um, copepods always have that round distinguishing body as their main body, but then they have a little, like almost like a triangle tail and the two antenna on top, and that's always, you can, you can kind of distinguish them. There's no really telling way to actually tell what type it is unless you get a microscope, because I mean there's, there's thousands of different types of copepods. But amphipods though, a um, little bit you're bigger. Again, you're thinking fish tank. Yeah, <laughs> fish tank though. But still, I mean, same, co same, talk, same I, concept. I was always, always, always thinking they were copepods, and then I'd always get corrected and told they were amphipods. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, you, you can tell the difference between amphipods and copepods though. I mean, it's just like, I, I, I have a microscope at home because I got curious because I had some different copepods in my tank pop up. And um, they were oh, actually uh, there and there. Yeah, a type of, uh, really what, is, what does the internet say? 
<laughs> what is it? Yeah, what is it? Does it say? But yeah, those are copepods, though. So you can honestly tell. Look at them. Thank you. I never yeah. knew that. Let's see how something Jack about that. Cuckoo for cocoa pods. I am cuckoo. For <laughs> 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 but but I like. Must be a cereal. Yeah, but I, I like the little microverts like that. It's always kind of they're always kinda some of the coolest ones to see. <laughs> Alright. On to the rocks. That's that is a cool stop. Yeah. Nice spot on that. Yeah. Cool. And I learned more about amphipods and copepods. Awesome. Ooh. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the um, <clears throat> scientists on shore say that that is a massive, a very large keratoiasis. Um, and I agree. It, and it did. It had some very strange branching on some of the lower branches. That it I did, yeah. Not a couple of weird the same bird's nest like others. structures. Yeah. Man, the rocks, they just. <laughs> this part of the seamount just doesn't want to give up its secrets. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll eventually uh, get a good opportunity here. Right. So um, uh, the scientist at shore is also also giving advice or information on um, shrimps versus amphipods. And um, shrimp are decapods, so they do have 10 legs on the thorax, and they carry their embryos with on their swimming legs. Um, on the swimming legs of the abdomen, and they have a carapace. Whereas oh. amphipods, which are paracarids, they have seven pairs of thoracic legs, no carapace, and they carry their embryos in a pouch under the thorax. There's also, and then you know he mentions that there's lots of other differences, but the abdomens um, is where they look different. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What about the copepod? Thank you, Scott. Look at those pillow assaults. Just look at them. The shrimp just went like. Oh, this one just like went, just, it just like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? What's the terminology again? <laughs> is this, is this the, uh, the official jargon? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How do you spell that? Uh, Any way you want. Okay, cool. Anyway, I love that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it basically hit the end of this, uh, where, where it could flow kind of more um, along a slope, and it hit this vertical space and just, like, spilled down. Wow. So when you're, you're talking about a lava flow, then? Yeah, so this yeah. is part of, uh, you know, one, one lava flow that... Uh, Got to experience a little extra gravity. Wow. Oh, and it goes all the way up, too. How cool is that? Let's see, there's more of your uh, traces. Yeah. That's really pretty interesting. Um, so can you, um, for anyone who's been, you know, who hasn't been listening for this entire time, what, um, so this, this is a, this is pillow basalts, and that, yeah. um, can you explain like why why it's kind of in this formation and then what um, how the lot like what happened to the lava to sort of make this these formations or um I don't know oh sorry exactly um, it, uh, just like the description that you were giving us earlier about how you differentiate these pillow basalts oh okay um so what I'm looking for with pillow basalts is kind of this this worm like uh, sort of uh, um, round rock forming uh, kind of outcrop like what we're seeing right here. And these are, uh, yeah, stacks of uh, pillows that over time kind of wove around each other uh, 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 to, to build up this, this area. And looks like, you know, the one that we're centered on right now uh, had a little bit more uh, oomph to it than some of the others because it looks like a lot of these have uh, uh, stalled around here. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty um, cool. Some have, some have broken off, but like pillows like this or like this, those are all, uh, those, those all look like they've uh, naturally truncated and haven't broken off later. Wow. So, um, and yeah, the way that you get this is you get uh, these sinuous, you know, relatively slow moving lava flows uh, that form these, these sort of fingers that, uh, that come downhill. And uh, as, as the, the, like the way that, the way that they propagate uh, underwater is uh, you, you get this uh, blob of lava that uh, 
very rapidly uh, quenches and uh, forms a glassy rind as uh, it contacts the seawater. So the outer part of it forms a shell that basically freezes right away. The inside's still molten, and then uh, uh, as the lava keeps moving, because you know there's you know there are hydraulic rules that apply here. Uh, there's still lava coming down from further up. So at some point, the internal pressure of that system becomes a little too much, and uh, the crust breaks, splits open, and then you get a new uh, a new glob of lava that comes out, and it forms another one of these round features. So just rinse, repeat, and in, in some cases, it does actually. Uh, uh, more continuously flow, and I'm not sure if that has something to do with like viscosity of the lava or some other conditions with it. But um, yeah, that's what how you grow up a stack of. It does that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's pr it's pretty loud on the hydrophones, isn't it? <laughs> no, I wanted you to make the sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. We all yeah. want to make the sound. <laughs> 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 something like that, anyway. <laughs> I believe it 100%. <laughs> Can you imagine just being under or just being by a volcano all of a sudden here? Bleh. <laughs> what and if that actually was the probably noise? like really deep and rough. Yeah, like so then we've got bigger problems like if that's the case. <laughs> all these flow yeah, salts. It's got more rumble to it, I think. <laughs> oh, I think we scared Daniel off. I would imagine. He was hanging out in the studio behind us. <laughs> It's interesting because it also seems to create a lot of like varied um, heights for different corals and sponges to grow on top of, which is um, you know, always important for coral, um, for these sessile organisms. Very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. And so the, now is the, the the, the cooling for these pillow basalts, is that different than the cooling for like sheet flows? Mm. And is, is that some of why Structurally, they... it can vary a little bit, okay. um, but it's it's all kind of, you know, the, the, the same uh, basic principle at play. So uh, with pillow basalts, they kind of quench from all sides and uh, as it cools and contracts, uh, you start to develop these uh, joint patterns. And in uh, these, these uh, lavas that are more round or uh, uh, ovate in uh, uh, cross section, you'll see all of these fractures pointing inward. So they look like, you know, spokes, uh, spokes of a bicycle wheel, like uh, uh, radial uh, weak points. Right. And okay. that's, so we, we look for fragments of those uh, that are kind of wedge shaped in, in rubble piles. So that's that's one of the that's one of the shapes I'm looking for uh, for this rock hunt. Uh, sheet flows. Um, those those are larger and cover uh, broader swaths. So they kind of uh, cover the substrate that they're erupting over, and uh, they they uh, still quench and cool, but um, those joints are all going to be uh, uh, vertical and basically point straight down toward uh, uh, oh, sure. uh, the bottom of the lava flow, and uh, uh, the top of it will look sort of it, it'll remind you sort of of mud cracks once it's all dried because uh, all cooled. <laughs> um, this lava is definitely not completely dry. <laughs> uh, uh, so you get these hexagonal fracture patterns that occur that you can sometimes see on the top of a sheet flow, assuming it's not totally encrusted with manganese. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's that's uh, so you get radial jointing in uh, pillow basalts, um, and then you get uh, uh, vertical columnar jointing in uh, sheet flows. So, oh. th and that's what helps uh, give us those. Uh, th that's what helps uh, make some of these rock fragments that later break off uh, that that kind of angular or wedge-shaped look. So. We right. see that, we, we uh, know that that's probably the kind of rock that we're after. Right, and yeah. you're after that kind of rock because you're trying to get information about, she you know, the, 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 yeah. the, <laughs> the, vol <laughs> the volcano and the, the magma and, you know, information yeah. on, on this specific volcano instead of, you know, instead of like pumice, which uh, are, are our Coming um, from rock elsewhere. travelers. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out the... Uh, Origins of these volcanoes, and uh, uh, I, I'm a member of a team, along with some uh, geochronologists, and Hannah is one of those, uh, who are working to figure out exactly how old these seamounts are. Ooh, this is looking rubbly here. But it's pretty round. Yeah, it is looking pretty round, isn't it? I wonder if there's anything in here. Anyone on the backside? Yeah, maybe there's something a little further up. Some 
some stuff right there to the left too. Yeah, a couple of these look all right. The candy corn oh, one. Wow, looks like that bamboo fell. Yeah. Looks like the rock yeah. it was on I, I think it got <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because that rock's probably only a few kilos at most. Yeah. And perhaps delicately balanced. Whoop. Anything exciting here? Um, I see a possibility maybe here. That one looks pretty good. Actually, that one looks nice. Yep. Okay. That is a nice rock. <laughs> I like that boulder. That is a nice, nice boulder. <laughs> okay, the craft's on. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of wedged and angular shaped ones in this pile, so I think uh, I think we have found our stop. Hopefully, <laughs> and then we'll be good for a while longer, uh, at least on the rock end. But we'll keep an eye out for bio as always. Oh yeah, that looks good. That's a nice rock. That is a nice rock. Oh, oh it has a, has a friend. Star. All right. Yeah. Looks awesome. Star Thank reside. you. Um, yeah, you have boxes B, C, D, E, and F open. Said uh, B is in Bravo. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if it's gonna fit in that. <laughs> gonna have to dunk it pretty hard, Robert. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare gonna, the crowbar. It's gonna, have to, gonna have to be a power <laughs> jam. Let me see. Uh, Oops. Yeah. Wrong way. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Huh. Seems like it needs to come out a little bit more though. Yeah. I might have to go with an E. Yeah, Sounds I think so. Going for an E. Nothing but nothing. Beautiful. Thank Look you. Thank uh -huh. you. That is a nice rock. Mahalo, Kanamo. Mahalo. Now, this is data confirming that with a sample 104. Perfect. Thank you. Kukui, I also have I've written in the notebook here, there was an attempted 104 with a Niskin, but it, I'm guessing that one it didn't work yeah, because the no. Niskin didn't collect it. Okay. Yeah, none of the Niskins are okay. right now. Yeah, Jake said he tried them all, so whoever rigged them messed up. Thank you, Catalina. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're pretty close to waypoint four, so making pretty good time. Got 11 waypoints to hit, and uh, very interesting morphology up at the uh, summit that uh, I think a number of us are uh, very curious about. Yes, me too. I'm <laughs> also curious about this possible caldera. possible caldera that showed Pot up in the uh, bathymetry. Yes. May or may this uh, may or may not be one. <laughs> both yes and no to calderas. On the spectrum of in? calderas, and you know, it is on the spectrum of caldera. I believe so. From yeah. Non caldera. Ooh, fish. Cald oh, that one looks different. <gasps> it Look does. Lasers off. It's a little stubbier than some of the ones we've it seen. It is. Mm -hmm. Can we get the laser lights turned off, please? Yep. Uh, 
That's interesting. Yeah, it's got a very blunt nose. It's got some, oh, it's got some of the little whiskers, the barbells that have been adapted. Um, hi, friend. Tell us your name, please. Please. Now, does it have those scales? Oh, it, oh, uh, that might be in a fitted? No, snailfish? No, I don't know. Uh, their head reminds me of an fitted. Yeah, it's yeah. the potato head. It's the potato <laughs> it's head the fish. Potato head. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm it's not just, seeing just a darker the, variety. the scales or the lateral line that would make it, that would make me certain of what it is. Um, is it but it does have a similar tail. that darker brown line um, towards the dorsal top, uh, like a different lateral oh. line? Or oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It could be. I was I was thinking of it as like a muscle. Um, but yeah, you're right. Oh, no. Oh, I see no, what there is a scale line on that, though. Okay. Oh, oh the jellyfish. And a halosaur. A halosaur. <laughs> fight, fight, fight. <laughs> no. I think they're friends. Oh, they are friends. They oh. are friends. <laughs> <laughs> Fish are friends. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kukui. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I just ate fish yesterday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a. We'll go with the fitiform. There's a couple options within that that could work. That's fantastic. Yeah, we haven't seen one that. Oh? It looks. It looks visually similar to um, this Ophididae spectrunculus grandis. The fins are maybe a little bit off, but still very s visually Ooh, similar. Cranially. Where did I find it? More zoom. Oh, hello, crinoid. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's being shy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Moving on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. That was really cool. Can we turn the laser lights on? Yes. Back on? Thank you. Awesome. Oh, this is so pretty. What we're coming into here, all the, the different sponges. We've got the sponges and the crinoids on the sponges, and we've got some bamboos, it looks like. Wow, this flow here is so interesting. Too, all the different spaces for different organisms to attach the varied heights um, of this sort of Pillowy. I'll label it pillowy because I don't know better. Um, but yeah, this is pretty interesting. We've got some paragorgia as well. Oh, and that's a nice uh, living Walteria sponge. Oh, can we get a zoom on this actually? Thank you. Zoom in. Oh yeah, that, that bamboo has seen better better days. Looks like it's colonized by some of those um, anemones as well as hydroids. Interesting. 
green. And then behind it is a really interesting um, coral as well. Like looks like maybe a Rodana Ritacortia with uh, something on top of it as well. That's pretty cool. Yep, more leash. A little bit. Let me give it to you. Oh yeah. Thank you, and, and Scott France just confirmed that it is a it is a Rodana Ritagorgia. Um and it looks like it's got a crinoid on top of it, and maybe a shrimp yeah, associate as well. I think uh, just over here, yeah, we're seeing more of those uh, anemones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they start with an M. I do not know how to pronounce it, um, but I think it is Metridioidea. Are, are the anemones that we're, are, or well, it's the larger group that the, those anemones we see are within, so. Okay. Okay. Awesome, thank you so thank much for that zoom. That is a big, big an anemone. Wow. Oh yeah, that's a pretty good size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be another um Oh, and some, oh wait. Or uh, it's got, nope, that's an anemone. Okay. I know, I, I, right, led, you we saw one of these I yesterday. led you astray the other day trying to differentiate between two very particular types of um, anemone looking organisms. And unfortunately what I told you only works for those two, not for all anemones. Right, yes. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. we saw one of these yesterday though, or last dive. Yes, I think we did. I think it is. That was yesterday. Uh, was it yesterday? I don't even I don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an, uh, I think it's did in the larger Friday? group of actives. <laughs> <laughs> what is. Um, We're inside the folds of space time now. We really so. are, yeah. There's no telling when it was. Stock sponge. Oh, yeah. Oh, and a beautiful crinoid up there as well. Mm -hmm. With the, is that a brazingid? Oh, and a tiny unbranched. Oh, they're on top of a Walteria. Zoom in. Oh yeah, that I think that is a brazingid and a crinoid hmm. and some and a snail and some brittle stars. Wow, it's pretty impressive. All the all the thing all the organisms <coughs> all the organisms that you can see on top of a single um, a single sponge. Yeah, you know, oh, and hydroids. And a red blob that may be a ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically the whole party showed up again. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? They yeah. all want they all want to be a wedding present. Oh, They're jealous. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's so interesting to see um oh, that's cool. Um it's so interesting to see all the organisms that live you know, practically within the same, you know, the space, right? Like this crinoid, this brazingid. They're on top of the exact same sponge with you know, all these different organisms and sea stars, right? And it's just, 
it's so interesting to me. Um, and you, you see crinoids and you see brazingids separate, um, but you know, it's it's just interesting to see them all this bunch together. Then, like, mm -hmm. what is that? You know. Yeah, you can see some of these uh, pillow flows. Some of them doing the kind of like bulbous thing. Others uh, a little bit more. Uh, uh, oh, you can see more in the back too. Mm. Just uh, kind of float continuously uh, without uh, uh, kind of having to break through itself. Interesting. Dr. Val, we have a couple questions, a couple geology questions coming in. First one is crater versus caldera. Please explain. <laughs> so that's one essay question. And then the second essay question is about uh, trying to understand, do the, do the hot spots move or is it the plates that are doing the moving? Oh, those are two very good questions. Yeah, that uh, one's a 20 pointer, first one's a 10 pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, a crater is uh, uh, craters and calderas are um, pretty closely related structures. Uh, you know, um, a, a crater is uh, uh, pretty, uh, it usually but not always, a little more um, on the smaller side, uh, and um, basically it has to do a little bit with the. Uh, 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 ratio of the depth, you know, like the bottom of the crater to the width of the crater, if I remember correctly. Uh, so most of what we're going to see are uh, uh, craters at uh, volcanic peaks. With a caldera, um, that's uh, that that can be a larger structure, um, uh, and uh, what happens there is you have like this whole kind of. It looks like basically a uh, block drops down within that uh, caldera system. And uh, you end up with a much wider uh, 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 down dropped area or recessed area uh, than it is deep. So it, it looks a little shallower. So kind of like a pot versus a pan. Um. <clears throat> I love that explanation, pot versus pan. I can imagine it right away. Does the, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to our home islands and uh, thinking about uh, Kilauea. Yep. Um, and wondering, what do we have there? Do we have uh, do we have a crater? Do we have a caldera? Is it is it maybe with this recent eruption, can can they can they transition from crater into caldera? Like, what's uh, what's going on there? Um, I I think you, I, I think it, yeah, you potentially you could transition a crater into a caldera under the uh, the right circumstances. Um, if there's like a large scale subsidence or something, but on. Uh, I, I don't know the mechanics of that exactly. Yeah. Um, on, Kil on Kilauea, uh, uh, that is a uh, pretty well-formed uh, caldera. It's a, it's a few kilometers across, so it's pretty large. And uh, uh, you can kind of see how the floor of it sits lower. And that one actually uh, underwent a caldera collapse cycle during the 2018 eruption. So That's you right. can see where a lot of the uh, caldera floor dropped even further down. And it was a, It didn't affect the uh, the entire caldera system, but um, uh, well, technically it did. It deformed most of it, but uh, it most heavily impacted one side of that caldera. And if you look at the summit of uh, Mauna Loa too, you'll see a uh, large caldera there as well. Yep. Oh, thank you. So. And for our uh, that's ten out of ten. You got ten points, Doctor. <laughs> uh, but uh, this question of, of the hot spot, you were showing me some great graphics yesterday, or some visualizations of what these mantle plumes looked like. Um, we've been talking about the, these different directions that the Pacific Plate has been moving in at different periods in history to create these different island chains over these hot spots. But yeah, for just, I guess, the, the kind of basics of, of what creates these island chains, what's happening with these hot spots and the, and the tectonic plates. Um, Hang on just a sec. When you're ready, drop Sorry. some knowledge on us. Uh, oh, yeah, and slight addendum to uh, uh, crater versus caldera as well. Um, craters, you uh, you can generate through uh, uh, basically blowing the rocks mm -hmm. uh, out of that area. So that's how you get some of these uh, craters forming near the peaks of uh, uh, stratovolcanoes, which tend to be more explosive than what we get uh, with uh, seamounts or in the Hawaiian Islands. Right. Although some of the Hawaiian volcanoes uh, are 
they most certainly go through uh, explosive phases every now and again, too. All right, to the uh, uh, second question. Um, let's see, what was, what was that plates one again? And, plates and hot spots. Plates how and how hot are those spots, working sorry. together? Um, What's that dance all about? A little bit scattered this morning. Hey, uh, it's early. Yeah. Uh, plates and hot spots. So uh, what we Do think... It. We think that plate uh, plate motion is uh, by far the dominant control over uh, the hotspot tracks that um, we can trace across the seafloor. And um, the hotspots are assumed to be, quote, mostly sh uh, station stationary. So um, they, they tend to be more or less in one place within Earth's mantle. However, um, there are situations where uh, the hotspots may be deflected or might uh, uh, we'll move around a little bit. I'm going to interject real quick just to let people know that this is a uh, another candelabrum bamboo coral I-4. Um, and it is honestly so beautiful and I love seeing these. Okay. This is my <laughs> second, that was that my second ID, favorite. That ID so is from you. Scott France. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Virginia. Nice. Mm -hmm. These beautiful bamboos, candelabras. Yeah. Yeah. So over like um, you know, tens or hundreds, um, about 120 million years. Uh, a lot of, you know, these really long hotspot tracks that we're trying to trace, uh, a lot of that is going to be representative of uh, movement of the plate over the hotspot. But um, a really good example of uh, plume motion is uh, actually the Hawaiian hotspot, where we think in the Cretaceous, uh, like early on in the Cretaceous, the hotspot might have been interacting with a nearby uh, spreading ridge which is now long gone and somewhere else. Uh, and that, that ridge um, is where you get uh, particularly thin oceanic crust because it's just, it's just forming there. Uh, the lithosphere is much, well, not the oceanic crust, the, the lithosphere is particularly thin because you're generating that new crust and you're starting to build up uh, that uh, lithosphere. And the older the, uh, uh, the, the uh, basically the older you get as far as oceanic crust, the thicker the lithosphere uh, uh, that includes that crust will be. So you get like uh, uh, upper lithospheric mantle that starts to uh, uh, build up below over time. And it's a, and that can form basically a, a, a slope of sorts um, uh, uh, that uh, gets, gets uh, shallower as you get closer to that mid-ocean ridge and a plume and a ridge interacting, you can often get plume material that's drawn upward Fish. along that uh, slope uh, toward the ridge. So plume ridge interaction, it's a fairly common Friend thing. And uh, as, the, uh, as the spreading center and the Hawaiian hotspot eventually uh, uh, stopped interacting over time, they got further apart, the Hawaiian plume probably drifted back to um, uh, a, a less tilted or a less skewed uh, position which uh, has actually uh, served, we think, to um, make the, uh, the, the famous Hawaiian emperor bend uh, as uh, sharp and distinct as it is, because we don't see quite that same sharpness in some of the other long hotspot tracks that we've traced through the Pacific. Yeah. Of course, some of that has to do with like spherical geometry considerations too, but um, it, uh, the Hawaiian, the, uh, that, that uh, is fairly steep angle on that Hawaiian emperor bend is uh, is still very noticeable. Um, you said spherical geometry, so the, yeah. the earth isn't flat. <laughs> it is not flat, oh. sorry. <laughs> the internet is now very disappointed. <laughs> and actually, oh, no. um, it's it's not even perfectly spherical either. That's right. It's, uh, what, what we, uh, the technical term for that is oblate spheroid. Oblate, uh, yeah, a little uh, bulges in the middle a little bit like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so partly um, Earth's spin causes uh, the planet to flatten out a little bit, and then there's some, um, there, there's some, uh, you know, minor uh, perturbations here and there that are related to uh, like uh, gravity anomalies and such too. Uh, so it's it's not necessarily a perfect sphere, but it's a uh, it's pretty close, and um, you know, makes me happy. I get to live here. So yeah, that's true, and that that's interesting that that. Um there are, that has to be taken into consideration when, when drawing these lines. Drawing a line around a sphere is always uh, a little bit different than it is a drawing on a, on a plane. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also these other factors, these ridge plume interactions. So it's, it's so complex. Um, I think most of us, for most of us, it's a simple 
idea. The plate's doing the moving. The, the plume is, is more or less stationary, but it's never Mostly, that simple. Yeah. Yeah, never, never that easy. Yeah. And we, we've documented some potential other plate motion and some other plumes too. And one thing that one of my colleagues uh, has, has worked on is uh, uh, using some of these long-lived Pacific hotspot tracks. Uh, he can compare uh, coeval um, segments of these, you know, seg uh, segments of different hotspot tracks that formed all about the same time and looks at the changes in distance between these hotspot centers to get an idea of relative plume motion. Okay. And we have a lot of trouble doing this in like a truly absolute reference frame yeah. um, because we don't have anything in the planet that we know of that really stays completely still. Uh, uh, hotspots are probably about as close as we can get because all of the plates are moving. Um, we don't really have any other, uh, you know, we, we don't really have a good reference point from those. Um, so, no, yeah, I mean, uh, the way that works is you, you can assume that one hotspot might be fixed in one place, and then you look at the relative motion of the other hotspots around it, but, you know, if you change that reference point, then you'll see motion in the one that you, uh, uh, potentially, uh, in the one that you were using as your sort of arbitrary fixed reference. Oh, excellent. So it's like imagining, hey, you know, if uh, I want to say the Rurutu Arago hotspot is uh, completely stationary, I would stand on uh, Rurutu Island or uh, Arago Sea Mountain, kind of uh, visualize how the other plumes might be coming closer or further away from me. Wow. So that, that's just kind of how the relative uh, reference frames work. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Speaking of uh, relative reference frames, oh, before I go there, yesterday, our amazing crew got to pass by Manawai, Manawai, and witness a beautiful beach gathering on that coral fringed <laughs> reef there from a distance. Mm -hmm. Spotted quite, quite land. A yeah. Right, it was right <laughs> on the Hawaiian. We were, we were uh, very horizon. excited. You were very, we were all very excited to be able to spot land after being three weeks uh, without being able to see land. It was quite nice to see evidence of the, the beautiful shallow waters and atolls of Papahanao, Mokuakea, those mm -hmm. sacred Kopuna Islands just just above the surface. That was one thing. And then I thought, oh, you know, we have some folks in this watch who have a deep love for the Gulf of Mexico, as we call it. Yeah, they've done uh, Zach over there in Houston and Catalina, Nolens and St. Pete. Um, and I'm just, I heard, I heard a little bit about it yesterday. Catalina had offered us a little window and saying where she would take the Nautilus. And I'm, I'm curious to know more about kind of how those, how those waters are quite different, quite different than what we experience out here in the, in the middle of the Pacific. But uh, Catalina, Zach, you guys want to share anything that, that you love or appreciate or enjoy about those, uh, those Gulf waters or those deep deep spots or not so deep spots in the Gulf of Mexico. What's going on over there? <laughs> There's a lot going on over there. I mean, I love I love the Gulf of Mexico for so many reasons. It's um it's so rich in terms of like just the food it provides for the coast coastal communities. I mean, I grew up eating Gulf of Mexico seafood and it's just so delicious and, and so it's very bountiful in that sense. And then from the geological perspective, too, I think it's a fascinating place. We've kind of mentioned before, um, there's the history of the big Jurassic salt layer that underlays a lot of the Mississippi River sediments that weigh down on it now and gives it a really unique, a really unique geology with all these salt domes that kind of pop up through the sediment, like kind of like a giant lava lamp is how I think about it. Um, I love it. And that's, you know, the northern and kind of western part of the Gulf. And then you get over to the east by Florida, where, where I am now, and you get this incredible carbonate platform that's kilometers thick. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I love the Gulf. I mean, I grew up there, so I'm biased, but mm -hmm. I think it's a really wonderful place that has provided so much for the people that live along its coasts. You were describing, I think, um, I don't understand much, but I, as you were describing that um, sort of stacks of carbonate, that big shelf, and and some freshwater seeps that were coming through that, and because of the because of the makeup of those rocks in Florida, a place I love and and have some connection to as well. But um, yeah, as I was reminded of in Hawaii, we 
you know, our volcanic islands above the surface also hold so much fresh water. The rock is quite porous. And so fresh water trickles down and, and we often get water flowing through these lava tubes and um, we can find patches on the reef, sometimes pretty far out into the yeah. ocean where we get these fresh water seeps that always so impressive to me, so beautiful cold. and uh, yeah, so cold. The water's so cold and, and, and abundance of life uh, around those. And uh, it made me, uh, even though the the geography is quite different, so many of the factors contributing to the creation of those spaces so different, but that uh, just made me think of Vai. And as we passed Manavai yesterday, um, you know, thinking about fresh water and uh, Kane, yeah. Kanaloa's, Kanaloa's brother, who tra they travel together um, through these islands and Kanaloa's now the Akua associated with uh, deep sea and salt water um, and also the water, the fresh water deep within the earth mm -hmm. and Kane is uh, the Akua, of the deity of, of fresh water uh, yeah. and the water that we that we drink and use on land and mm -hmm. and so thinking about those connections and yeah excited to go back to Florida next chance I get and play in those waters what a beautiful spot Zach and I were talking about uh, surfing yesterday, sharing some favorite surf spots uh, along the Gulf Coast. Not really, world, not not as not as known around the world for its great waves as uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. but uh, but still a lot of fun to be had. I spent a few years living in Pensacola, Florida, and caught a few good hurricane swells and winter swells over there myself. So love the connections. Where else? Where else in Where else in the world are we bringing in? The Great Lakes, bringing mm -hmm. in the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, Chesapeake Bay too. Chesapeake Bay, that's right. You're yeah. Oh. I, uh, Talk about yeah, seafood. From, from Michigan, oh. but I've uh, been all over the place. <laughs> that's for right. school and stuff. Oh, should we start talking about lunch already? <laughs> I'm, I'm seafood. I'm a big seafood Ooh, fan. Yes. And they got great seafood. Gulf seafood and and great Chesapeake Bay seafood. Hmm. Goes I'll back to that poke we're gonna get when we get Ooh. back home. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna interject real quick and um, talk <laughs> about some of the corals we've been seeing. <laughs> Tell um, us. We've been seeing some Rodana ritigorgia, um, and I think some primoids and paragorgias as well as um, as some of these bamboos. And actually, you can see a Rodana ritigorgia over there right on the there. left as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, as well as the uh, Walterias. Um, yeah, so pretty interesting. Here we have four meters, Bob. I'm also seeing what, what looks like some polyopicon sponges, you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and quick. several different sponges that we've been seeing. Thank you, Kukui. Mm -hmm. So, just kind of interesting to see how it's changing. You know, we've the the morphology has changed um, mm -hmm. pretty rapidly. Of um, the rocks that we're looking at, I guess the topography or, um, has changed pretty quickly, and so it's uh, interesting to see the potentially related um, changes in sponge and coral communities as well. The, the empibenthic, above the benthic um, seafloor communities. Sorry, I didn't mean to like kill no, that conversation we, though. We, that's well, it was, you know. I love I love finding connections, but these are more connections. All this and um, watching how the watching how these features change and communities change as we move along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. These these places have never known fresh water. Mm -hmm. That kind of blows my mind. Right. Yeah. This things buried in the deep sea and yeah, pretty interesting. Mm <laughs> yeah, you know, we usually don't act up with that anyway, but uh, yeah. yeah. Kane is actually Kanaloa's counterpart. They're made as opposites, but Kane is also known as the god of Ao or light. And whereas, you know, we've also been mentioning throughout this whole expedition that Allah Omwana Kaiuli is that 
Kanaloa is the god of pole or darkness or the depths. Um, and yeah, they're they're always traveling together. There's a lot of Mo'olelo yeah, stories like about that. A bit. You can see some of the uh, radial fracturing on that lava flow there uh, oh. broke open. Nice. Sorry. No, no, no. I saw an upside no. down smiling face. So I was like, what? I think that's what had me thinking about it, uh, Mahina. Is this this, uh, this sort of concept of, of counters? You had spoken about it earlier in the expedition. How things on in the sea often have their their counterparts on 